Hello, hello, hello. Hi, hi, hi. It's been dead. Oh, that's right. show and tell no show and tell today wait where's the lid for this thing yeah i'll find it later this is my favorite game of all time well of all time i don't know if i depends on my mood Probably my favorite is this is middle gear solid 4 great game phenomenal game it's about the military industrial complex the real the whole series is, is about that really. And that was the first time I'd ever been introduced to this concept that governments around the world stage wars in order to make profit from the weapons that are sold, the industries that are developed in the midst of war. Very sophisticated theme. And it was explored in, in, in serious depth. It's very hard to... It's a rare game. I, I think it's hard to, to come by these days. And you can't really get it on... Like you can't buy it digitally because... Yeah, several reasons, but... So you have to own a physical copy. I think if you own a PS3, you can get it digitally on the PS3 store. Is the PS3 store still active? I don't know. The PlayStation store for the PS3. I'm not entirely sure. But anyway, it's a great game, man. It's got this suit. So you see the suit. And he wears he wears this suit. And they did something very interesting. It's a stealth game. Well, stealth is a major component. Hideo Kojima, the guy who made the game, is actually recognized as the godfather of stealth in gaming because Metal Gear like the original Metal Gear, the the two D, uh, the two D action game before the first Metal Gear Solid on PS One, like the original original Metal Gear that that was like recognized as the first ever real stealth game, where stealth was the like primary mechanic in the game, objective in the game. 
some people will say it's this, you know, these debates, there's always someone who says, no, it was actually. So I guess I'll say it was the first big one that anyone recognized as doing that. It made the wave, it made the biggest wave, the first big wave in that regard. And many people, and, and that was the game that many people drew inspiration from, your splinter cells and all these ninja games and whatever the case may be, whatever came after that in the nostalgia genre. Was spearheaded by Metal Gear, um, and in the game, the the main character wears this very cool sneaking suit, and whatever it touches, it takes the color of. So it's like camo technology, like camouflage. It's very very cool. So there was like a scene where he touched a watermelon and his suit took on the color of the watermelon. Um, and it, it can just do that throughout the entire game. So no matter what environment you're in, you can literally touch a wall and, and take on and the suit would like turn brick colored. Or you can touch like a, pa- a checkered couch, like with a checkered pattern, and your, your, your suit will develop that checkered pattern as well. Like literally anything, like floor tiles, if you lean against floor tiles that have a certain pattern on them, your suit will literally take on that. It was very cool, ahead of its time. We haven't really seen anyone do anything like that since then. This game was made like what? It came out in 2008. So it's an old game. But still so many things that it, it That goes to show you, like, creativity, man, like, regardless of technology, regardless of the technology you have at your disposal, if you don't have creativity, that technology is useless. It's like, a tool is only as good as the person building it. So you see, like, in modern technology, you have all this modern technology, <clears throat> and yet, a lot of these games are not that interesting. Why is that? Why is it that we... Making games is is easier than ever before. And yet, it seems like... We're struggling to to make titles that compared to the the titles of old. Some titles are really good. But, you know... It's kind of like in cinema, like the movies that are coming out these days are terrible, despite all the technological advancements we've made. <clears throat> so, Metal Gear Solid 4 is a masterpiece. At some point, it held the Guinness Rail record for like longest cutscenes in the game, like total runtime. If you put them together, it would, it would be enough to make like a feature length movie or something like that. I, I think the longest cutscene in the game is like a. Uh, 30 minutes or something. I can't remember how long. It might have been 20 something minutes. It was a very, very long cutscene. <clears throat> yeah, so it was long cutscenes, but it's very cinematic. It's a, it's a story. He's telling a story. He's telling a story. And I enjoyed it. The game grew on me. I played it the first time and I was I didn't understand what the hell he was talking about because I was a kid when I played it. And he's talking about very deep, 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 deep concepts. You know, military industrial complex. And I just didn't get it. Man. But then I played it multiple times throughout the years. And then finally, that maybe like a two years ago, three years ago, I can't remember. I played it and it clicked. What the message of the story clicked, and I was like, "This is profound." You got a bunch of bureaucrats, a very small minority of people, making decisions on behalf of all of us, and they're the ones running these wars. And some of them, not all of them, are evil. Some of them think they're doing things for the greater good, but you weren't elected to do that. No one asked you to do that, and all you're doing is just causing more death and destruction, and you need to stop. And that was the main character's main character's goal was to put an end to it. 
very compelling story. It was so deep and making me want to play the game again. It was, it was profound. It was, it was truly profound. Anyway. <clears throat> very inspiring. I've talked about how before, I've talked before about how one of my goals, one of my big goals, as soon as I have enough capital, enough money, I want to buy an office space, hire a small team, and make a game. I really want to do that. I'm committed to that. And I'll get it done. Buy an office, hire some people, make a game. You know, I was watching this Unreal Engine 5.4 showcase. Because it was, it was just the Unreal Engine is basically like this this software development tool that allows people to make games. To to put it very simply, for people that don't know what it is, you can make games in it. Well, my understanding is that uh, you can do a bunch of things in it. You can make the environments for your games. You can create the animations now that for your characters in your games you can design a whole bunch of things that will be in your game um, I'm not entirely familiar with all the software tools that are used in game development and which programs are necessary that, that, that they are used industry wide and all that sort of stuff but Unreal Engine is definitely one of the big ones that is used for a lot of things like creating environments and Yeah, designing your game. So they were talking about how they're streamlining a lot of things and a lot of stuff that used to be done in other software, in other programs, can now be done in Unreal Engine 5. So it's it's uh it's streamlining the process, it's making things quicker, rendering times are being reduced. So you know like Things that made the process of making a game extremely long and tedious are being uh, streamlined and made more efficient. So the result is that something that could take hours or days or even weeks can now be done in moments. Something that used to take multiple people can be done with one person. So on the negative side of things, lots of people will probably lose jobs because of these technological advancements. But on the positive side of things, you can make truly incredible games with less people now. So it's make it's making the market more accessible, and that's that's a natural consequence of technological development is that the that things change and if you're unable to adapt you get left behind like that's what happened with the industrial revolution a lot of machines started taking people's jobs and as factories became more and more and more and more efficient and it's going to continue to happen you know with ai and robots becoming more of a thing i don't know if you saw boston dynamics showcase the new robot the new human and robot and yeah, these things are going to be all over the factories now. So people have to adapt. For me, I see a serious opportunity because, like I said, I want to buy an office and hire some people. Now I'm like, okay, if I want to make a great game, I maybe only need 20 people now. 20 hardworking people. Because what used to take 100, 200, 300 people can be done with 20 people. And, you know, if you're extremely hardworking, like, oh my god, the, the, the sky is the limit if, you're, if your team consists of very, very hardworking people. Like, you can do a thousand people's job, job with just 20 people because of this new technology.
so I see a serious opportunity. And you know, the beautiful thing about that is the less people you have working, the more profit you have to share amongst each other, you know? So the money you make isn't divided. Instead of it being being divided across a team of a thousand people or however many people, you know, it's usually like hundreds of people. Instead of having money split amongst that large group, you now you can have money split again across a, like what, a couple dozen people? Amazing. You could be a soccer engineer, you could be a, a, a script writer, you could be this, you could be that, earning millions, dude, if, if the game is successful. Even if it's moderately successful, because the team is small, you can you can reap immense profits. So there's so many, there's a lot of benefits to that. I'm looking forward to that, and I'm definitely going to do that. I just need to... Work my way up towards that. Work, 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 work. Um, first step towards getting there is writing my book. Writing a story. I need to prove that I'm capable of writing a story from start to finish and writing something that's actually good. I wrote a first draft for my novel. It was about 90,000 words. But... It wasn't, uh, it's the first draft. It's the first draft, and I realized I couldn't even use, I couldn't use anything from it because I realized I, I wasn't going in the direction I wanted to go in. So I had to start again. Um, this time, I'm keeping things very simple. My philosophy this time around is that if it's not, if you, if you can't explain it in a sentence, remove it. So with each chapter, <clears throat> when when the characters are doing something or there's some goal they need to achieve, I ask myself, well, what is this goal? Please define it for me so we can see uh, how complex it is. And if it's too complex, we're not doing it. So that's kind of been my method. And I've been making good progress. And then another thing I've kind of changed with my approach is instead of having these sessions where I'm writing a thousand words, two thousand words a day, I've, I've, I've said it's okay to write a hundred words or two hundred words. Make it incremental and don't overextend yourself because I realize that when I, um, when I try to write too much at once, my mind tends to run wild and, and, and that's when my idea starts to get more and more um, convoluted. Like I lose that simplicity. Whereas if I just take it, if I take incremental steps, I just inch my way towards completing the story while keeping things simple and easy to understand. And that's my goal. My goal is to write something that people like can, can enjoy reading. It's not overly complicated so that it's hard to follow. It's very simple, very easy to follow. You're not wondering what's happening and who's this character and how did they get here? And No, no, no. I want to keep things very straightforward and simple so you, you always understand what the character's goal is, what they're trying to achieve, why they're trying to achieve it, who is who. You know, sometimes I'll be reading books there'll be so many characters doing so many different things that you kind of lose track of who's who and you have to be reminded and and you you forget what some of their goals are even because so many things will be happening at once and I want to avoid doing that I want to avoid boring the audience with unnecessary details you know I'm writing a pirate novel It's, it's pirate fiction and from, based on the pirate books I've read, there's a lot of unnecessary details that get shared about the equipment they use, the, the inner workings of the ships, and the structures of the ships, all these sorts of things, and how they, they, they prepare gunpowder for the guns, and how to insert the gunpowder into the... All, the, all, all these details that, you know, it's interesting, but... For the purpose of the story, it's irrelevant and you can end up boring your audience.
because it doesn't really move the story forward. <clears throat> what it is, is the writer would have done a lot of research and they wanted to show you that they've done a lot of research. And it's kind of like an intellectual flex. Someone, I can't remember who said it, but they called it intellectual masturbation. Where they're just showing, like, look, look how smart I am. Look at how much I know. <clears throat> I did all this research. Look at me, look at me. Where they're showing you that they know an unbelievable amount of information about weather and weather patterns. So now when the ship is out at sea and there's a storm, it's not enough to tell you that there's a storm and there's like, strong winds and strong tides. They have to tell you the fine details about what type of wind it is, where it's coming from, um, how many knots it's moving at, and stuff like that. Um, and it's like it's, it's unnecessary information. Like you, you keep keep it simple. The goal is to guide the reader on a journey, and the moment you start in, inserting these unnecessary details, the reader gets um, distracted. You know. You pull them out of the narrative, you pull them out of the, the experience, because now it's become like some intellectual exercise instead of a, a, a narrative experience. They're, they're fighting to understand what you're trying to say. I want, I've always been a cinematic type of writer. That's, I've always enjoyed reading books like that, that give me that cinematic feel. And I've been told that that's what my writing feels like. I'll post. I'll post a, a excerpt today of something I wrote from my first draft. Since since I can't use any of it, because it, it, it went so left, I think I'll just start sharing many, many... Well, I'll share what I think is good from my, my first draft. And you can read it in my community tab. And then you can let me know. Let me know. If you're watching this video right now, once you're done with this video, I can go read my excerpts. I'll probably post something today, this evening, or when I'm done with this video. And you can let me know if you saw this. If you, if you, if you saw that, and if you read that, and you can let me know what you think. Um, I've always been a fan of that, that cinematic style of storytelling. And what I've been told is that when, when, when people read my work, it's like they can see it. They can, it's like they're there, they can see it, they can feel it. And I like that. I like that you're immersed. And I want to maintain that feeling, you know, throughout the entire book. Because sometimes you're reading something and you're very aware that you're reading something, you know. It's, it's, it's like, it's too complicated. It's too... Too focused on the details and not on the, the objective, which is to immerse the reader into this world. So, yeah, I want to get that done first. Write, write a good novel, and then I I have the story for my next novel already. Uh, not planned, but I have an idea of what I want to write next. I know what I'm going to write next. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, maybe I should close this window so it's just less noise. Yeah. The goal is to just write, write, write. And then I, I, I'll know that um, I'm prepared. Prepared. I am capable of writing a story from start to finish. Writing a good story from start to finish, and then I want to write, write many more books after that. In the same way, I'm prolific with my music. I'm hoping to be prolific with my, uh, with my writing. You know, with music, I put out uh, hundreds, I put out hundreds of songs, and um, I think I'm just that way. You know, with my ASMR, I put out videos every day. Uh, with 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 writing, I also want to be very prolific. I want to test my limits. How how many books can I put out in a year, for example? Well, this year I just need to put out one. That's the goal. Just put out one book this year and you've won. But then after that, I'll, I'll crank it up. Maybe put out two books and then three. And then It's like with my music. I started out uh, putting out maybe 20, 30 songs in a year. I can't remember how many songs I put out when I started out. 
but I eventually got more and more ambitious as I got more confidence. I went to three songs a week. That that worked out well for a while. Then I felt like, at some point, it felt like I wasn't uh, being stretched anymore. It felt like too easy. So I went to five songs a week. And that was a challenge, and I felt tired at the end of that. But then when it was time to make music again, I felt like I could do more. I felt like I'd rested enough, and that potentially I could do more. So I tried to do a song a day, and I managed to do it. I, re- I released 300, 300, what? So 2023, I released 300 and something songs. I can't remember how many songs it was. I think it was like 310 or something like that. So for like 310 days straight, just dropping songs. And then, yeah, this year I'm doing the same thing again. The goal is to stop in December, so I should have over 300 songs by December. So if you're writing, if you're writing this one of my books, it'll be the same thing. Start out slow, but eventually get to a point where you're putting out multiple books a year. People say quality over quantity. I say quality. Quantity produces quality. You know how they say practice makes perfect? The more you do something, the better you get at it. I'm the type that I just need I need to keep going. I don't like resting too much. I don't like not being able to put out my, my work. You know, I don't like sitting on stuff because I'm going to be creating regardless. So I might as well put it out. You know? I could like not make a song a day. I could just have days where I don't make songs and maybe f- focus on one song for like a week or something. <laughs> but it's like, no, there's no need for that. Make the song, move on to the next one. That's me. That's all me. So, yeah, that's just the way I am. That's why I'm wide, even with ASMR. When I had my seven day break, the, the seven day break was actually nice. I enjoyed the time off. It was nice not being required to make a video every day for seven days. Just waking up and being like, oh, the only thing I have to make, the only thing I have to do today is uh, make music. That was nice. But then I started to miss it. lot you know I, I was missing the interactions with the people i was missing the money I was missing watching well the subscribe count was going up regardless but you know i was just like i probably would have reached seven thousand subs much earlier oh by the way i reached seven thousand subs I forgot to celebrate that Ooh, seven thousand subs sick I did that in two weeks, which is amazing. Seven a thousand subs in, 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 in two weeks is amazing. Cause I was at like six thousand two weeks ago. And now we're at seven thousand already, which is by the way, that's very, very exciting because it means I'm growing at a faster rate now. It means things are quickening. Finally, things are picking up. And I just need to keep working, keep praying. And yeah, we'll be at ten thousand subs. That's been a big goal, get to 10,000 subs. Once you're 10,000 subs, you're in the, in the top, what is it? 0. Point something percent. Well, I think it was like 0. 0.8 percent or something. I can't remember. So that's, you know, that's a great, that's a great benchmark to reach. To be in the top 0. Point something percent of YouTubers, amazing. And then from 10,000, you want to get to 50,000, you want to get to 50,000, you want to get to 100. But it's also about the quality of your channel as well, because there are a lot of... No, they're not a lot. By definition, there are not a lot. It's, it's relative. But, you know, they're, they're in, in, in the ASMR space, there are quite a few channels that have more than 100,000 subs. But, you know, they have strong communities... What's the engagement like? What's their content like? Is it is it, awesome? is it this? Is it that? I'm trying to cultivate um, a channel that 
it will come to where you can get something out of it, you know? I like that I can share my thoughts and we can have exchanges in the, in the comment section and you can really hear me. just what you can get elsewhere you know like a lot of people do the same things i don't want to be replaceable i don't want to be just another talking head or another another face i want to bring myself to the picture be myself and be irreplaceable and i think i'm you know i'm succeeding with that for the most part People can say a lot, but they can't say that uh, I'm not being myself, I'm not being me. So, yeah. The unique thing about my channel is my perspectives that I share. A million people can do triggers like this, but no one really has my perspective on things, no one really has my voice or whatever the case may be. That's what I try to utilize to set myself apart. But yeah, this channel is definitely a stepping stone to my other dreams. I'm going to write a book and hopefully people will buy that book when I promote it on this channel. I'm looking forward to that, to seeing how that pans out. And then, like I said, when I have enough capital, the first things I'm going to do, fire office space, fire some people, use Unreal Engine 5 point whatever the case may be by the time I do that maybe it might be at Unreal Engine 6 by then use that engine to, to make an unbelievable game with, 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 a, with a very small team it's exciting stuff so yeah let me know what you think in the comments no words, man. that's gonna happen that's definitely gonna happen as a big goal of mine and I'm gonna have to see that too. So yeah, we'll get there, we'll get there. I'm gonna share, I'm gonna find the excerpt right now to share. Make me need time and then you can let me know what you think. You're not allowed to pray at the end of all videos, just in part, peace and blessing, all of yourself. So dear Father God, thank you for saying that you're watching this right now. Thank you for making them whole, unique, and guiding them on a path towards peace, prosperity, and purpose. Thank you that you've blessed this person with wonderful people in their life who love them, take care of them, bring the absolute best out of them. Thank you for maintaining the ones that are there to do the same thing. Thank you for blessing this person with the spirit of gratitude so they can give thanks for all the wonderful things in their life. And by giving thanks, they can find peace, contentment, and attract even more blessings. Let your presence be felt in this person's life so they know that you're God, that you're that you love them, you're always going to be there for them. Good health, long life, and happiness over this person and everyone they care about. In my name, I pray in Jesus, I pray in